I, I was thinking this, like, obviously we're talking about um, kind of essential or crucial upgrades to Bitcoin as core and to Lightning and, and things like that. Um, but obviously, large institutions and governments probably don't want to see <laughs> this priv these privacy-based upgrades. It's kind of like, you know, from, from our perspective, and, and, I, and I guess from yours as well, you know, we're very much pro, I mean, I, I very much am pro having privacy and anonymity where possible and uh, all of these upgrades being made to Bitcoin. Um, but I can assume that, yeah, large financial institutions and governments won't be because essentially for the large financial institutions, they want to make sure they're abiding by, you know, AML and KYC laws and they don't want to get in trouble with the government and they don't want to touch money that has somehow been involved in you know, money laundering or terrorism funding or theft. Um, and for the governments, they want to have control um, at the end of the day over their people to a degree. And they also want to make sure that they aren't, you know, uh, making it easier for crime to, to go ahead. So I suppose there's this kind of on, ongoing, I, I can foresee there being a battle between, um, you know, the general populace and, 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 and Bitcoin fans and then the government and large institutions who kind of will want actually less and less privacy probably and more openness um, and more KYCing at, at the point of exchange from fiat to Bitcoin. So I don't fully see it that way because governments aren't really like, it's convenient to think about governments as something, as, as a personalized thing that has one wheel, but that's, that's not the case. It's, in, in fact, just going back to, to your Know Your Customer example, like is Know Your Customer, doing Know Your Customer really the, really what the, the exchange wants to do. I mean, the exchange wants to provide privacy for their users and not ruin their privacy. So, so, so that, that doesn't stand in their interest. And similarly to governments, I mean, it, you can only, only ruin the privacy of your own citizens. And you might make that, that decision there, but but probably that's not what you will want to have because then your citizens won't have privacy and, and the citizens in China will. Uh, or, or if you think about from an economic perspective or, or, or on a historic perspective, is that the, the, the war on encryption has been won by the cypherpunks, right? Like encryption is everywhere. The US government doesn't have a export control on encryption anymore, or maybe it does, but no one cares, who cares? The point is that the cyberpunks won because politicians have insecure property rights and making, so, so for example, there was a case called Clipper Chip. Um, I just read about it yesterday. Uh, have, you, have you guys heard about the Clipper chip uh, proposal? It, it, it was about everyone has a Clipper chip in, in the 1990s, and that will be their encryption key there. And the special feature of that Clipper chip is that it's not only you can access that, but also the US government uh, have access to your private key. So. So, so, so that's the big idea, and and they were really pushing it when encryption came out, and and I think it still did not, they still did not give up on it. But who cares? Like no one knows about it anymore. At that time, it wanted to be the big thing, the big. This is how we are going to use encryption with this clipper chip. Uh, it didn't work out that way because politicians have insecure property rights, which means that. I think Bill Clinton was at the time in, in, in the White House in the US. And, you know, he was not incentivized to, to actually try to push this clipper chip incident, clipper chip on the people, because that would be very unpopular, even if 14, 20 years from there on, it would be much better for the US government if they can, um, if they can get access to every single person's <laughs> encryption, <laughs> private key, uh, but but he wasn't incentivized. He, he 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 didn't want to take that risk. He he was incentivized to have short-term decisions, and that means they are not pushing the creeper chips. 
So, so, so I think even in the incentives on the governmental level are, I do not perfectly <laughs> great for privacy, but most of the people understand why they have to close the door when they go to toilet, right? Like they understand the value of privacy inherently, you just have to like, like make it explicit. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, Adam, uh, what do you think would be the biggest um, uh, limitations or barrier to uh, adoption of some privacy tools? Would it be, you know, people's reckless, you know, careless attitude towards privacy, or the lack of, you know, um, user-friendly options? Like, I remember you did mention that um, with the Wasabi uh, with uh, 2.0 that you intend to remove all the, you know, possible frictions that will enable users, you know have a seamless experience you know, while using you know, um, Wasabi. So what do, do you think is, is the lack of awareness of what you know, privacy, privacy tools could mean for them or the lack of privacy could actually you know, mean for people? What do you think would be the, the biggest limitations for people adopting the privacy tools? Mm, I, I think I have a very specific answer for it. And maybe, maybe let's go back in time a little bit and think about Xiaomi and eCash. Because, you know, when, when the cyberpunks figured out how to do an anonymous currency, not a decentralized one like Bitcoin, but in the 90s, an anonymous currency, uh, then people think that Xiaomi and eCash did not get used because, because government shut them down. But that's very far from the case. Actually, that might be the case, who knows? But the point is that that's what people think. And if you look at the research, it <laughs> even today, you, you wouldn't have a proper Chomian, a proper anonymous eCash just yet that could be used properly. So I think the technology, the the user experience, that's the bottleneck here. People are not going to use a software that they have to set up a Linux for and type things in the command line, right? And that's what most privacy software user experience is like. So I, I believe you just have to make a software as easy as any other software, except with privacy, and then you will have adoption. Gotcha. So it's like, um, yeah, I suppose it's like if you look at some of the super privacy focused, like uh, Linux distros, and and even like the Linux, uh, I think it's like the True Phone. I can't remember it's called now, but like the mobile phone that's based. Uh, there's no real incentive for a lot of people to use them, even if they are super privacy plus, because. Uh, well, it's more expensive, but, but you're paying more for a product that just doesn't work as well or isn't as usable as like an iPhone, basically. So the challenge is to make something as good as an iPhone or an Android device, but and, and at the same cost or less, but that is privacy pro and privacy focused, I suppose, which is quite a tough challenge to do. So I did ask that question because um, I remember when, you know, lots of people came around saying, you know, you know, you to WhatsApp, you know, your privacy is, comp your privacy is compromised and, you know, um, they're going to spy on you. Another rumor, you know, that fear mongering happening back then in Nigeria during the whole COVID-19 scare and the vaccine scare. And people like, don't take the vaccine and like, oh, they can spy on you, WhatsApp. And, you know, due to that, you know, mania, people went and started downloading a uh, Signal app. But um, despite the fact that Signal is, you know, I think to an extent, a bit friendly, there was no... Um, the the usage wasn't quite there. People weren't using it. They were then downloading and setting up setting up the profiles, but they were not actually using the app. So it now led them to think: Is could it be the same problem on Bitcoin, where people are not just you know just there might be an outrage, you could be full you know full outrage, you know it's all you know um, how do I put it just for, all for cloud, but there is no real um, urgency for them to use you know privacy tools. So maybe they are not really aware of the dangers. Um, of not, you know, trying to, you know, make their transactions, you know, private. They feel, you know, they are, you know, they are also willing, you know, to KYC on exchanges. You know, they do not see a problem with, you know, shielding themselves. You know, even online, you just share whatever they like 
you know, they feel like sharing online, when they should, you know, be, be a bit more careful and try to up their, you know, upset. So um, I tend to agree with what, you know, Adam has said, you know, regards to the fact that, you know, it has to do with, you know, um, the user experience, you know, when they have to, you know, feel they have to do too much. You know, when we are, we are in an age where, you know, everything is simple with a few click, you know, clicks of, you know, the button on your app. But right now they have, they feel like they have to do too much, but I also feel that it has to do with an attitude towards privacy in general. Mm -hmm.